All right. How are you doing? Good morning. Good, <laughs> good morning to you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, so I, I saw something. Well, there's something I've been tracking for a year or two now. Uh, some friends of mine are involved in uh, scientific uh, research of various sorts, and they've been telling me about this for some time. Have you, um, have you heard about uh, organoids? No. Okay. So let's uh, let's see if this will work. If we do a little, little, uh, little video presentation on. Uh, I'm sure they were an animated cartoon in the '80s. <laughs> well, if only. <laughs> check check it out. Let's see if we can hear this. You get the idea. These are organs that are grown in petri dishes in the lab. Mm -hmm. um, this one talks about growing a new lung, and they scaffold the tissue to create something <laughs> that uh, approximates the lung. Um, and then, because it's made from human tissue, they can run tests on it uh, and see how mm -hmm. medicines and pathogens um, respond. But even more right. kind of interesting to me is that they can cultivate your own tissue. So they can make an organoid that is your brain or your lung or your intestines, and they can do um, experiments on them. So uh, in the Wikipedia entry, they basically say these are miniature versions, simplified organs that are grown in the lab uh, with stem, using stem cell tissue. And the sort of applications of it... Um, are pretty wide. I think we're only uh, a layman like myself are only just sort of getting our heads around uh, what this could be. But um, I think this is really interesting. And why it's particularly interesting to me was because I was working on a mind uploading story project a long time ago. And at some point came this issue of, well, how do we explain this to the audience, you know, in a way that sounds like it isn't totally mm. f science fiction, um, uh, but could be believable. And at the time, I wondered if uh, I sort of settled on this. Um, I settled on this idea that I saw where you basically freeze the brain and you slice it as thin as you can, like uh, thinner than salami. Um, serial <laughs> sectioning and they said basically if with the technologies they have today they could probably slice it thin enough to get to see enough of the neurons and the connections between them and basically they would slice the whole brain scan each slice and then recreate the neuron connections in uh, in some other medium like let's say a computer or something but what okay. strikes me as interesting is that maybe they can do that to grow an organoid eventually scaffold your entire brain as a copy, as a replica. And then um, I was sort of trying to imagine what the, what the applications of that would be if you grew another brain of yours. Um, now, obviously, if it's being sectioned, you're dead. So it, it could be mm -hmm. something that uh, you are resurrected, let's say. Um, and, and we've done these... Um, I mean, there have been obviously films and stories about this sort of thing, but I just think this is a fascinating mechanism, at least a, an insight into how this act might actually be done. And I don't know, I, I, I have to think on it more, but I was sort of imagining somebody who, who um, I guess, passes away and then they wake up as, a, as an astronaut piloting a ship where it's just their brain and their body is now this entire vehicle when they're just spending their eternity traveling through the solar system or something because someone was telling me that when it comes to space travel that 
catering to humans is really problematic because they have to eat, they have waste, they have to exercise, they have to have oxygen. You know, there's all these things that it'd be better if you just had a robot or unattended vehicle uh, operating in space. But how could you, you know, really give it AI that would uh, deal with every situation? I just thought, oh, yeah, <laughs> it can do a mind upload organoid <laughs> and just have that pilot the ship. I don't know. I'm wondering if yeah. there's, I mean, what else? I, I don't know. It's just something to think about. So I throw organoid out there uh, to think about. But but obviously, there's other things like personalized um, medicine is, is I think, going to be really interesting. Remember, I don't know if you remember uh, of like um, in the 90s, people went on about one-to-one -one marketing. It mm -hmm. was a, a big deal. And they were saying how, and, and the internet sort of made that a bit more of a reality. But this was when the internet was pretty young and people were saying we could, you know, do one-to-one -one marketing, make something just for you. Everything would be customized. And, and now we know that's a bit more, that's taken root as algorithms and things that, that watch our behavior and, and recommend stuff to us and, and that sort of thing. But I wonder if organoids will bring one-to-one -to, -one to medicine in some way, uh, which I think would be pretty cool. Mm. All right, mm. well, that's a, that's a topic perhaps for another day, but... No, David's, I mean, no, it's, it's, it's daily it's uh, weird it's item. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, the personalized medicine would be the, the rich person's version of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, the idea being that you, anything in you that failed, you would have a backup ready to go. Hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. So remember what was the film where they did the sort of organ harvesting movie? Uh, where was the, it The Island? Yes, I think you're right. The Island. And they, where find they, out they that had clones, and the clones thought they got to leave the island, but in fact, they were just being harvested for the originals. Yeah. Right, right. I thought that was deliciously horrible. Mm. Um, mm. And, and of course, the protagonist of the movie is a clone, so they don't realize that they are the clone. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, yes, we can do harvest, har organ harvesting. I think it's interesting <coughs> that, that when they test out some of the stuff now, they've been growing um, human organs and pigs which is very disturbing. But I suppose growing something in Petri in, or in vitro in the lab is a little less disturbing. But I did, mm. I did see a video some time ago where they were growing a, a, tra a trachea for an esophageal transplant. Yes, so yes, I saw that, that, yes. And then a pair of lungs, remember they had a, they were scaffolding mm. lung tissue and growing lungs mm -hmm. in the lab. And mm -hmm. so I guess organ harvesting in the future doesn't have to be as horrific as the island. It'll just be this large warehouse full of. Uh, personalized well, it'll probably parts. be an organic 3D printer that mm. can take stuff that's specifically tailored to you so it won't trigger your immune system. And then it will build that out of your donated organic material. Mm -hmm. So you can just print new, new parts at home. Yes. I was talking to some other What's people. What's then the problem? The installation. What's that? Oh, the installation is the problem. Yeah. Installation is the problem still. <laughs> it DIY um, uh, kind of organ transplant is not yet. We haven't conquered that uh, that I challenge know. yet. But I do yeah. think that we could maybe. I was I was chatting to the the development team the other day about three D printers, and I was thinking about. Um, DIY um, plastic surgery, where maybe <laughs> maybe that sort of thing you could print at home, like a new a new skin or change your nose or you know just I don't know do the certain things that you can do at home and, and maybe though there's an out uh, um, outpatient procedure uh, yeah. process where it isn't or implants I guess you know they, they just give you a, a something that can implant the thing just below the skin or something it could uh, mm. this all this all this human modification stuff it sounds like it's getting closer to a reality um 
Yeah. Okay, I'm going to park that there in case it's useful. Okay. Uh, today, I just thought I wanted to just try some more of these sort of um, prompts. I, I thought that we could try doing um, some kind of character who has a complication, a crisis, and see, uh, and, and do it kind of rapid fire and see if, um, let me just let's clear the screen a little bit so we can see what we're doing. Um, and just see if we can uh, come up with something interesting on, as we do that. And then I'll have the premise cards just to, in case that could help us too, because sometimes I like the way that that shapes the conversation. So it's first to start off um, maybe trying to come up with a with our primary principal character here. Mm. All right, I don't know if these have been properly shuffled. Uh, but I haven't picked them up in a little while, so I'm not quite sure what's in there. So those are the it's modifiers. Exciting. Yeah, it's always exciting. It's like, what a, mm -hmm. what, you know, sometimes we get something we've had before and I might, I might remove that. But <laughs> <laughs> although, although I think the idea is to sometimes revisit things you've done before, because if enough time has passed, you do see yeah, it in slightly no, different ways. So, so I, I think some of the topics are, are ever, evergreen. All right. So we have a charismatic, Cult leader. Now, I think we've done that before, Great. but uh, it's, but um, yeah. they could be charismatic or they could be a disaster magnet. Oh, that's supposed to be magnet, not magnate. But who knows? Oh, Maybe that typo could be interesting. A disaster, disaster magnet, magnet is an interesting idea, though. Yeah. Oh, okay. A cult leader who is a disaster magnate. A catastrophalist? <laughs> catastrophalist. I love that. I don't have much makes space money, to write it. Down. Makes money by predicting catastrophes and the global response to them. So this is Nostradamus. Nostradamus meets uh, meets George Soros. I mean, if they're good. I mean, it, it, so the the good version of this would be uh, that classic television show Thunderbirds. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. A, a global rescue, international rescue. Who? Um, it's weird that Jerry Anderson hasn't sued the international rescue based in the United States, um, but the international rescue, who were non-governmental actors, who would go and deal with emergencies all around the world and in space. Well, it, that it, it's, good it's, version it's, of it. The bad version of it is someone who knows because of the algorithms, because of the predictive stuff, because of uh, they bring, so in their firm, they bring in the best geologists, they bring in the best seismologists. They've got all these people who, when they know that a catastrophe is about to happen, they don't warn people. Instead, <laughs> they, they swoop in afterwards and they're super prepared with all the, oh, I see. the, the stuff the, meant to be the, good, the, all the, the, the stuff for up. building back up the infrastructure. But of course, it's their infrastructure. Um, so well, under the guise of that, they are taking money from the UN, they're taking money from all these other things, and then of course they're siphoning off all the charity money into their own coffers. So I'm going to call this disaster harvesting. This is uh, the the people that, uh, so you're saying they don't create the disasters, but they predict no. them and they're all ready to go. And yes. then they, they predict them and then don't warn about them, but then take immediate economic advantage of them. I like that. Um, so, the of a hat. so this is Thunderbirds are go. Not yet. <laughs> Wait for the crisis to really develop. Wait for it to mature. Yeah. Okay, now Thunderbirds are go. Now, now we go. You know that when you mentioned Thunderbirds, because I haven't watched it since I was a kid, but I realized that this is sort of a a neo neoliberal dream because it's not as if yeah. there are government agencies that respond to world incidents. No, yeah. it's a private corporation, of course, of, of wealthy individuals yeah. who say, yeah. it's just basically, um, you know, Mr. Tesla saying, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna yeah. send a, oh, a submarine that, to save the war, to save the kids in the cave. Yeah, yeah. except they're competent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, the difference. I, I actually, I think this is, this is Thunderbirds as if it was run by Goldman Sachs. So it's, yeah, there you it's go. GS birds. It's sort of like you know, Goldman Sachs are go. Goldman so, what did a company like Goldman Sachs have this to have a department like this? They must do because they must have a predictive. They do, but they they've also done some naughty things where they um, they yeah. have been caught in the past 
uh, playing both sides and doing things like stockpiling uh, uh, aluminum and stuff like this so that they can can benefit from shifts in the market. In other words, they're making the market quite literally, not by yeah, moving exactly. the markets with the stocks, but they're actually stockpiling physical assets and things to move the market and 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 play both sides of the equation. So that's a that that would be the GS version of Thunderbirds are they create the disaster and then they go mop it up versus the 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 new the other version of Thunderbirds which yeah. waits for it to happen just predicts it and then says we'll we'll go. I mean, in other words, this is well this is Team America. So Team America is like the GS Thunderbirds and and Except Team America is inept. <laughs> These guys are really savvy, and they know how to uh, how to create mayhem in the world. Uh, but um, yes, the predictive. So you need a good predictive engine, and so the, yeah, the disaster magnate is really cool. Um, so if they weren't Thunderbirds, what would you call this disaster magnate? Um, you know how some of these mercenary mm. companies are called things like executive outcomes. Um, yes. I wonder if it could be sort of one of these firms like Blackwater or something, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, except you have a much nicer names. name like Helping Hands or Hands Across the Sea or uh, Hug as your H U G, whatever that would be, Human something, something. Okay. Um, helping Hands, Helping Us, Helping Ourselves. I thought that was. Yeah. Uh, um, We're here to help. H E L P. There you go. Okay. It would be called. So H- a uh, human emergency life preservation. There you go. <laughs> human emergency so life preservation. Help, and then they just show up. And so it would be uh, the story would be a journalist on the scene who's covered two catastrophes, and both times the sort of help has arrived first. Yes. And they begin to become suspicious. That's right. When the help arrives before before the calamity and then it's yeah in fact timing. yes that's right so mm. walking past an alleyway looking down the end of it help containers are already there huh. let's see i'm thinking of help the p is premonition so it's sort of like premonition <laughs> systems yeah but and no no but in their public face they wouldn't reveal the, the whole point is they would have a public face that's just hey we're here to help mm-hmm. and then and people would think that but then this journalist realizes and sees when they're not meant to that the supplies are already there. So, uh, fascinating fact, uh, during the Pacific, after the Pacific war, um, the U S had to find a place to store most of its Pacific land forces, which weren't ultimately used in the invasion of Japan and the country that was chosen to store them weirdly was Vietnam. Hmm. So people have gone from that to doing conspiracy theory about the Americans knew the next place they were going to go into was Vietnam and pre-placed their military there. Hmm. Let's see. So you could, so these guys would be sort of moving personnel and equipment around all the time. Yep. So all the supplies would be there right before the thing happens. Hmm. Do you know there, there, that when I wrote the premonition systems, I realized that of course art imitates life and, um, you know, it's Peter Thiel's, his Palantir. Palantir organization is a bit like this. Oh, yes. Yeah, where they, <laughs> they're looking Damn. for uh, d- d- profiting from disaster and, and surveillance and all this. So, Palantir, um, bloody. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, yeah, let's have a look. What is the Palantir story. Um, if there's anything good. Uh, private, a private American software company. That specializes in big data analytics. Mm-hmm. I sort of feel as if this is, yeah. Um, from what I've read, there's something that sort of smells a bit like Palantir and what we're discussing. Uh, oh, Palantir could be in line for a multi million pound NHS deal. Hmm. Great. Fantastic. Oops, I don't want to do dot com. I just want to see what. Uh, Let's see what good old Wikipedia has to say about about Palantir. Mm. Oh, of course, uh, this is the other thing. They're always naming stuff after Tolkien's novels. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of these characters who love to to do this. 
Okay, so they well, said they big data these, analytics. Um, this is uh, uh, Ian Banks, Ian M. Banks stuff. Okay. For his ship Inf names. Here we go, the Information Warfare Monitor. I love that. And Recovery, Accountability, and Transparency yeah. Board. Um, Good Lord. Let's see what else we got here. Anything interesting? Um, GhostNet. Mm. Uh, this, these names are wonderful. Um, mm. No, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Don't want to get them involved in that. That sounds like they no. would they would be the ones exploiting and then benefiting. I mean, this is horrible to think about. I see. Palantir at Gotham. Um, what has this got? Uh, platform includes the privacy and civil liberties protections. And I don't, don't know about that. Uh, Palantir Metropolis connects to commercial proprietary public data sets, discovers trends, relationships, and anomalies, including predictive analytics. So there we go. So I was on to something there. Um, forward deployed engineers. Oh, I like that. So that's what these people, the people in the field call themselves. Forward deployed, like people say, who are you? And they say, I'm mm -hmm. a forward deployed engineer, which tells you absolutely nothing, but I like that. Um <laughs> Oh boy. Anyway, so that's lots of fun to be had there with a uh, volunteer. So that we've got our disaster magnate. So it's Peter Thiel. He's the, he's the, Thiel is the disaster magnate. Um, let's see if we can do something with a complication. I have a feeling that these complications are going to seem very, um, very tame after we've, what we discussed, but let's put this over here. I don't know if the organoids and, uh, and uh, disaster magnet come involved somehow, but let's see. Okay. Um, we have a failed to deliver. Okay. Okay. Um, right. This is a complication. So the, the disaster magnate failed to deliver. Uh, what does that mean to what us? Does that mean they the disaster did? failed to deliver? Oh, the disaster didn't deliver. So the profits are down in this case. Okay. So which might lead them to go, well, why don't we create a disaster? Mm -hmm. So it's only a minor catastrophe. Um, and so what we need is a, um, God, this is, I need to get bigger catastrophe. I need to get bigger pads. We need a catastrophe multiplier, <laughs> right? We need a catastrophe multiplier. Who will that be? Will that be a person or will it be a thing? Um, mm. have no fear. The catastrophe multiplier is here. Um, <laughs> Thunderbirds are go. I really want to. I want to come up with another, another name like Thunderbirds. I love that. The sort of, the 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 the, the motion in that word. The, the excitement. Um, mm. um, help, help is here. Yeah, yeah so help isn't the, quite it, but yes. Yeah, but it's sort of help is here. Da, 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 da. Help is on the way. Um, failed to deliver. So okay, so they engineered. They engineered something because they they would have egg on their face if they didn't um, deliver. Um, let's see if this develops into a crisis of some kind that's useful. <laughs> Please let it not be. There's one in here that I know is really stupid, but I hope it's not that one. Because, <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, black hole. All right. So I guess creating a black hole would be would be a bit of a problem. Um, but it could be uh, metaphorical, um, <clears throat> like sort of anything that sucks in memory, information, data. Um, uh, I guess an EMP could create like a data black hole uh, where you fry all the electronics uh, mm -hmm. and you uh, crash the stock market and you um take everything down or if it's a literal black hole i mean creating a black hole in space would be would be problematic <laughs> especially if it was near the earth <laughs> we're all getting mm. people sucked into uh this um okay let's see uh let's just let's try shaping this a little bit with uh tell us what sort of um what sort of story this is this is going to be? What are we going to learn from this story? 
We're going to learn that money talks. Oh, God. Okay, well, that that fits perfectly, doesn't it? There we know. Money talks. Rich, entitled people deciding who who or who they're not going to rescue. Mm -hmm. Well, there is, I think when you said that, rich and entitled, that's really helpful because, and Thunderbirds is really helpful because if you were to do Thunderbirds today, it would be different, I think, than Team America because Team America really just highlights how America goes around thinking it can make the world a better place and ends up sort of screwing everything up through war, right? But I think the yes. modern version would be what what this is about. It's 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 Bezos and Musk and all these people mm. who have and and Goldman Sachs that has more money than God, as they would say, who mm. who sort of think that that. Um, they have this sort of patrician belief that it's really up to them to do what's right and to take care of things. And in some yes. cases, it literally just means go to space and leave the earth to its fate. But, but this in sort of rich entitled attitude, I think, I think it's re- really relevant because, um, um, did you see the, I don't know if, cause you're in the UK and you've got your own problems, but, um, there's this, uh, this, uh, black lives, oh. Uh, matter Boy. video. Uh, let's see with um, Karen. Let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, yeah, okay, I found it. So let me let me bring this up and see if uh, if they have a video or not. Is there a video of this thing? Mm. Is this your- Okay, so there we go. So there is a video, and that's just time for us. And uh, and sorry for bringing you know doing all this, but I think it's relevant. So sure. Uh, property. Hi, I'm asking you if this is your property. Why are you asking? Because well, it's private property. Because it's private property, so sir. So are you defacing private property, or is this your building? Oh yes, no. You're free to yeah. express your opinion. No, you. We but do. not on people's property. Okay. Absolutely. Sure. And just respectfully. Sure. So we're just saying, absolutely, your signs and everything, and that's good. This is not. This is not the way to do it. Okay. It's private property. But if there, if I did live here and it was my property, this would be absolutely fine. Totally. If it. And you don't know if I live here or if this is my property. We actually do know. That's why we're asking. Oh really? Because you live here, right? You said so. Because we know the person who does live here. Oh. Okay. Then um, I suggest you call him or call the police. Or uh, because you're accusing me of a crime, correct? What I'm asking you is why are you... And I'm not answering you. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. So your choices are to call the cops if you believe I'm calling a crime, and I will more than be happy to talk to them. Okay, thank you. What's your name again? I'm Lisa. Lisa, what's your last name? What is your name? What's your name? I asked first, Lisa. What's your name, sir? Robert. What's your last name, sir? What is your first name, sir? I, I don't, I'm not answering, I'm not talking to you, you're talking to me, I'm asking you the questions. Well, we're not doing anything illegal. Neither am I. Uh, actually, you are. Mm. Really? Oh, okay, well then, call the cops. Thank you, we will do Lisa that. and Robert. Yeah. I'll be right here. Okay, thank you so Bye. Much. And that, people, is why black lives matter. So that's gone viral, uh, you know, lately, and, um, and, and of course, what made it so even more enjoyable to all the people that were upset by her behavior was that this is this man does live there and this is his house. Um, so it is that sort of, you know, entitlement. I'm taking upon myself to police my, you know, this neighborhood, which may or may not be my neighborhood. But it's that attitude mm. of, you know, I I can butt my head in here because I have I have privilege and I'm entitled to tell People no, like, the world is my neighborhood. Yeah, if I true. if I'm a global gazillionaire, the wor- the entire world is my neighborhood. Right. So, so this sort of I am the law, and yes. and whatnot. This this is ex- this is really accelerated um, or, or taken to an extreme by by the people that we're talking about. So that 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 video is a sort of microcosm of the attitude, but it's put on mm-hmm. steroids when we're talking about um, the disaster magnate who basically says, you know, I am the solution and it's upon me. And I feel as if culturally we have come to rely more and more upon um, the super rich to save us. Um, mm-hmm. uh, 
And I think disaster magnet is a good term for them because mm. they, yes, they, they don't always make things better. They have, you know, sometimes really kooky ideas and they've, and they've got a lot of money so they can, they can really make these things happen. Um, and so, you know, we may only just be able to take a bad idea and just leave it at that, a bad idea, but they can actually implement a bad idea. Mm. Um, and it's, and it's very pervasive. I was thinking about how I saw this um, video where these uh, students are at their graduation and this uh, wealthy um, alum uh, donor announces that he is uh, erasing, eradicating the student debt for all the graduates of yes. that class. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, uh, your first feeling is, wow, that's great. You can see they're all so happy and excited because, you know, student debt is huge. Yeah, huge it's issue. horrible. And so you're, you're, it's, it's uplifting. And then after I think about it for a few minutes, I think, yeah, but I mean, why are we leaving it to these sort of ad hoc philanthropists who, you know, at the, at the whim of their discretion, uh, can sort of save, solve these problems. And it's like, we're waiting for them to save us instead of saying collectively, we've got a problem here and, and, you know, let's, let's implement some kind of government program to do this or some other program. I mean, it doesn't have to be a government program, but some, some way to solve this social problem by other means instead of, uh, waiting for waiting to be rescued by the, the, the rich and entitled. And that has become ever present. So I think the money talks, uh, I think it's really, um, apropos to now. So, hmm. Yeah, so the Thunderbirds, the help organization, would be full of these captains of industry. Um, and I think the, I, I mean, of course, I see everything as satire, practically. But the captains of industry, um, you know, believe that they're, they're doing the right thing. So I think what they would do is they would go to fix a crisis. And they yeah. would put a Band-Aid on it. But ultimately make it worse. So that that's what I think of the example, the philanthropist who, who erased the debt, he did something that in the short term was wonderful, but in the long term creates more problems because people then come to rely and expect these individuals to save them rather than coming up with a, mm -hmm. a, a, a social program. So I like this idea. These, this, yeah, the, the help organization really is a, uh, the, the acronym could could mean maybe two things. Hmm. Very good. All right. Okay. So that's one to work on. The help organization. All right. Let's try um, another set here and see what we come up with. Oops, these cards don't want to come off the table, and as are these. Uh, this is my my reset. Is I've got, I've got a table that that's nice and sticky now. Yeah. yeah. Executive outcomes. We're here to help. <laughs> I hope you're recycling all of these post-it notes. Yeah, um, I am. I'm putting them in the in the proper recycling Good. receptacle. Good. All right, so we're gonna have now, you um, know other invented post-it notes. Hmm. Do What's you? that? What's how they were invented? Well, no. Uh, someone, someone famous as mother invented post-it notes oh i did not know that okay what's the story there no it was uh it's uh so it's michael nesmith's mother the monkey oh yes the monkeys yeah hey hey we're the his, monkeys hey, hey we're the monkeys yeah his mother invented post-it notes because a scientist at uh, is it 3M? I can't yeah. remember the company make them. The came up with a glue that only lasted for a They were experimenting with glues all over the place. And he came up with this glue that didn't last long. Mm -hmm. And she was the one who suggested put them on the back of little notes that people could then stick to around their office space. And I hope she hoped that... Uh, yes, no, she got, she, she got a cut of it. Okay, good for her. I like that. Okay, so mm -hmm. I'll, use, I'll use as much of them as possible. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> So we have, oh, a ne'er do well mm, useful, useful idiot. idiot. That's, again. That's, Jesus. No, the useful idiot. We've used that already. Sorry, you're quite right. We've done that to death. A ne'er do well social pariah. Hmm. 
Mm. Uh, okay. Let's see. Or let's try a negotiator. Okay. Well, okay. Ne'er do well yeah. negotiator is, is 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 kind of nice. That has nice alliteration. Does the ne'er do well negotiator? So, I mean, this is this is terrible if you're a negotiator who's supposed to talk de-escalate situations and suicides and all the rest of it, and all you ever do is seem to cause more problems. Um, well, but that can also be a ne'er do well negotiator is basically a lawyer, <laughs> right? So, explain, it, or it's explain. someone who is always looking for that angle that benefits them out of something. Again, a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> is there a particular reason why lawyers are on your no, mind today? No, I'm just saying that's that's their job, right? They're looking for the angle to weaken the other side. Therefore, yeah. anything goes. Okay, so and the better be. lawyer you are, the 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 better you are doing that. That's it's not a that's not a I I don't mean that to be a moral thing. It's just I think that's what they do. So it's sort of like you say weaken the opposition, but kind of to undermine right. the the arguments. Um, and a lawyer, but, a <laughs> but I, I mean I really like your idea of a hostage negotiator who's. But I don't know how the ne'er do well thing works with that job. It works well, outside, if, if so he's a terrible guy. If they're a hostage outside. negotiator, they're always being yeah. taken hostage themselves. You know, they're. Well, she's a terrible person. That's oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, um, so she's always saying, "Take me" instead of them, and so she's all and and the other police are going, "No, don't shut up, don't say that, don't say that," and then the hostage taker's like, "Sure." So yeah. she's always being taken hostage. Hmm. Um, it's, it's again, thinking of the, I'm sorry, because I have overhang from the last one, this idea of the negotiator is there to really help, but you know, if, if they're ne'er do well, they just keep making things worse and worse. Like they, right. like they're a terrible but negotiator. That's the, so the, okay. so the, the demands again, get bigger and bigger because they keep encouraging, yeah. you know, the other side to make, uh, to make even better, bigger demands or something. And, um, they do not, but that's. Uh, to go back, it's divorce lawyers essentially, right? The the whole purpose of a divorce lawyer is to stop the people from to stop the couple from talking to each other, so that um, you can not not saying you protract the the thing because that's not what it's about, but it's entirely about setting it into a path of conflict once you've got to that point, right? Well, you're you're also, on you're on the the ride to the end of the relationship, and it's kind of out of your control now, and so negotiator's point there is not. If one person suddenly said, oh, hang on a minute, actually, I want to get back together with that person. No, that's out of the question now. Hmm. So that's interesting. So that's if the divorce lawyer, if the getting back together is the outcome, the negotiator would probably be seen to have failed in their job because the company mm. wants the most acrimonious divorce possible. And in that situation, they had a happy outcome for the couple. Uh, mm. So... Who is a negotiator really working for? I guess um, is the question. Who are? Well, no, I mean, they're for their client, right? And so, if the client shows up and says, "I want a divorce," they are going to get a divorce for that client. That's the job, and therefore, anything else that's sort of coming along the way, like, "Oh, look, we're maybe we shouldn't ask for this much from them." No, 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 you have to. All this stuff. It's, it's, I mean, this was a, a friend of mine who went through an incredibly acrimonious divorce said this was, he, there were times where he just wanted to talk to her to try and sort things out. And his own lawyer said no. Mm -hmm. When he's saying, but actually, if I just spoke to her about this, maybe there could be a, an, an amicable resolution on this exact point. And they said no. Hmm. So it was stopping communication between them because that's their job, right? Yeah. Their job is once you've signed up to it, no, no, you're on this ride now. We're going to deliver you to the end point. I'm just going to see what the, what the origin of the word negotiator is because sometimes it's interesting to see. <laughs> I love the dictionary definition that just says negotiator, a person who conducts negotiations. Okay. Um, that, uh, I mean, you can't helpful. argue with that. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's a movie called The Negotiator, but I just want to find a definition, for goodness sake. So let's try etymology. Let's go to etymology. Etymology. Um, let's see what we got here. Let's put this up so that's not just me. Um, okay, so Latin roots. 
Negotiato. Um, late, uh, late 15th century, denoting an act of dealing with another person um, from the verb negotiate. So that isn't very helpful. I mean, what, what, is it, what did it originally mean? Um, mm. why, why is this such a difficult question? Okay, dealing with people, trafficking. Oh, I like that. <laughs> from Old French, business trade, and directly from Latin, uh, business traffic. Um, carry on business, do business, act as a banker. Um, a business, employment, occupation, affair. Also difficulty, pains, trouble, labor, literally lack of leisure. Wow. This has got a lot mm. packed in there. The sense mm. expansion from doing business also include bargaining about anything that took place in Latin, meaning mutual discussion and arrangement of the terms of a transaction or agreement. So hang on. So early 15th century, this was trafficking with people. <laughs> trafficking people. Um, that has different connotations today. Business trade, mm. business traffic. So you're like a traffic cop. So the whole notion of a hostage negotiator and whatnot is a new concept. Because originally it was about business and banking and trafficking mm -hmm. in, in people's decision making, um, which I guess is what we're, how we use it today. But that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. I can't say there's anything super useful in there, but let's think about it. So, so trafficking people. Um, see, the negotiator, m most of the time the negotiator is not supposed to put themselves in, insert themselves into the problem, but a ne'er-do-well negotiator would insert themselves into the problem uh, and, and, and help stoke the problem. I mean, you could company. have the divorce lawyer who falls in love with their client, but their client midway through suddenly wants to get back together with their wife. And so now the divorce lawyer is caught between, am I going to help them get back together or am I going to sever this relationship so I can end up with the person? All right, so so that could be just generically to get too involved with their client. They, they mm -hmm. yeah, there's uh, they lack boundaries. The ne'er do well, so that actually would explain why. Oops, I can't spell boundaries. That's not how you spell that. Hmm. This is like <laughs> this is like a, a a writing challenge for me. Okay, I use a keyboard too much. Okay, so the so the, they lack boundaries. I like that. It's sort of saying that whatever it is, whether it's their divorce lawyer who falls in love with a client mm -hmm. or they're supposed to be negotiating with some hardcore. Right. So whether they actually process. start to agree with the, with the felons in the bank. Mm. Yeah, you're right. There should be a more equitable distribution of money. Mm. Yes, exactly. They're, they're, they're sort of a social justice warrior. <laughs> they go in there mm. initially to to help the police and then they're like yeah yeah you, well you guys should try this and try that and you're absolutely right your your mm. society has made you you can't be held responsible for what you're doing and all this kind of stuff so so they, uh, that's the ne'er do well they kind of i like that that's that's developing into something all right the complication we have here is they picked a fight all right well um they picked a fight with the wrong person i guess or or something um that's actually kind of funny they go in there to negotiate and they end up fighting with the getting into a fisticuffs with the people they're supposed mm -hmm. to be. Um, yeah, this is like the negotiator who goes in to negotiate and ends up slaughtering everybody uh, and comes <laughs> out and says, problem solved, right? This is like a dirty Harry as a negotiator, right? Yeah. Dirty Harry is the negotiator. I solve every problem with a Colt 45 with an AR-15. Um, let's see, AR-15 is my solution. The Negotiator. Sounds like a bad movie already. Um, yeah. But uh, it could just be that they're really, um, that, that they're too belligerent. Actually, I, I had a, I had, yes, I know, I've known people like this, right, who they go in, they're supposed to kind of de-escalate and mollify, but they end up being the ones who actually start the fight. So you really don't want that person 
in the in the role as negotiator. <laughs> Let's see Unless you, yeah, 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 you're ahead. a catastrophist. <laughs> if you're a catastrophist, you want the negotiator who says AR-15 is my solution. to go in there because you want the China and India to go to war. So I think if we if we bleed into the previous one, our help organization, their negotiator is this character. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, they've, you know, they've the got a bad thing. negotiator who they dispatched yeah. a thing who's yeah. deliberately designed to screw things up. I like that, the bad negotiator. But just enough, right? So they don't want nuclear wars because that's bad for everyone. But they do want uh, proxy states to engage in low-intensity warfare. So this is bad by design. It's you, like, you, know, you, you heard about that China-India no, no, thing, tell right? No, tell me. Uh, what, what's the China-India thing? Well, so 20 Indian troops were killed about five days ago. Oh, God, okay. And China's not releasing how many of its soldiers died. Uh, both mm -hmm. sides are blaming the other for this border dispute. Mm -hmm. But guns are outlawed. So they killed each other with clubs with nails put in them. That's what they're arguing. I did, hear, I did, I did hear that there to go was the other, problems with the, the borders, the border yeah. Such. I didn't know that it escalated this, this badly. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. Wow. So they were the, the sides were just beating each other to death with sticks. So maybe it's because they sent in the negotiator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, uh, if you're a stick manufacturer, it's great. Sticks yeah. are back in. Well, okay. So the of course, to some people they never went out of style. So so um, that's this is like well, the arms well, dealer well, is the negotiator. <laughs> yes, it's like. Well, if you if you really want to kill each other, I have uh, I have a better way, more yeah. efficient means of uh, helping you do that. All right, I'm going to see if we get a crisis that that takes us. Well, a national emergency. I mean, yeah, that that seems, that stands to reason that that the negotiator goes in there, picks a fight, and creates a national emergency. Um, Let's argue that instead of incompetence and stupidity and everything else, that the current U.S government is utilizing and deliberately stoking all this stuff in order to push forward its own agenda. Well, okay. So, so here's a thought. Um, I don't know if this still goes on, but I know mm. that during the cold war, I was told that there was a team on the U S side and the Russian side who was a sort of nuclear disarmament team and they would spend time negotiating with one another uh, to achieve some kind of nuclear disarmament de-escalation. And mm -hmm. their job was very tough because throughout the Cold War, there are always hot spots in the Cold War where the two sides were very close to ginning up and egging each other on. And so these people had a pretty tough job. So you, it's a delicate balance, right? It's a delicate balance because that's a, that is an incident that could end up in the destruction of half the planet um, very easily. So if you put someone like Donald Trump into the negotiating team, you can imagine all the chaos that would ensue. Um, you're trying to blow up the negotiation by putting in this sort of erratic, um, narcissistic uh, character. Um, erratic <laughs> narcissist. <laughs> Uh, negotiator, right? Um, that's the narrative. Okay, well, but, but, but they always calmly, boast. Right? They this always is... boast about how they, you know, the the outcomes yeah, they yeah. achieve, right? I mean, yeah. it's it's only it's, two people died. Only two hostages well, died. Taking this on board, I, I, there's a there's a Trump kind of and they might have killed themselves. <laughs> there's there's a Trump a approach which I find very interesting, which is that you create the crisis and then you pull back from it and say, "I solved it," right? So you give yourself credit for achieving a good outcome when it was you in the first place that put everybody on the brink. So I think North Korea is an example, it's sort of like, you know, yes. we've always been this sort of pattern of containment with North Korea and not tried to engage directly and just sort of kept it contained, although that mm. is sort of like kicking a can down the road. So I'll, you know, agree that that something probably needed to be done. But then you have 
him calling him little rocket man and like, you know, creating this all this animosity. And of course, the North Koreans are getting very excited with their with their output. And then then they have to kind of meet up. Right. So the it's a it's a like a bad negotiation because I, I think what it is, is I don't know what you call this. What do you call it when you another strategy, which Trump uses a lot, which I think is quite amusing, is you put forth a really, truly terrible and awful solution so that everyone mm. just reels and goes, oh, my God. And then you say, oh, just kidding. And you come back with something that is that is terrible, but less terrible. And so people are just glad to accept that because it's less terrible. So it's sort of like you, you, you know, you should have gone here, but instead you went here yeah. Yeah. and people it's go, like, oh, my God. And you say, OK, we'll, we'll take that. Right. So it's a it's like um, ethics brinkmanship. Yeah, so it's you know, how sort of, far can you we'll, go? We'll accept the half bad scenario, right? Because it's not the outright, truly terrible yeah. scenario. So that's the kind of ne'er do well negotiator. It's sort of like the half bad outcome, and and so they go in, escalate the situation until it's truly on the brink, and then pull it back from the brink and say, "You see, you know, I I did it." Um, and so they're always creating a national emergency. I mean, okay, sorry, but he is the guy we're talking about is the the social pariah ne'er do well negotiator who creates the yeah. national emergencies, picks fights, emergency. and then says, and picks oh, fight. yeah, it's only I Trump. can save you." And yeah. money talks is the uh, is the answer. Oh yeah, sorry. Let's see. Yeah, so what, it's yeah. Let's see if so we get a different Trump. outcome slightly if we do different. Let me just see. So just, just it's to, Trump. I know, I know, it's Trump. Oh dear, every all roads <laughs> lead to Trump right now. It's him. terrible. Okay. Let me see if we can get it, if we can de-Trumpify this one okay. anyway. Nope, I had that yesterday. Sorry, got to um, got to give myself a little freshness. Sure. Yes. Okay. Just damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Great love defies even death. God damn it. Okay. Now, now we've now we've really flipped it. Um, Ne'er do well negotiator picked to fight national emergency. Great love defies even death. So they're going to basically immolate themselves in memory of <laughs> they're going to. Oh, yes, I see what it is. They cause like a like a nuclear holocaust and they say, but our, you know, the, our memory we will never forget, you know, our achievements. So uh, sure, love it, that, so even mean, if we're wiped off the face of the earth, our memory will survive. <laughs> they put something out into space. That's right. They they send a catalog of human achievements into space as the world is blown up. And they say, don't worry, everyone. We will be remembered by any future life form. It won't be in, in, uh, in vain, <laughs> even though I cause the destruction of mankind and the planet. Um, right. Something will live on. My DNA, I put my DNA into a capsule and it's on its way to future, to other planets to colonize. Right. That actually is funny if the the person that's the the one who caused all the trouble sends their DNA into the future. <laughs> they say, it's okay. We can all we can all die. I, I put my DNA into the the future capsule. Mm -hmm. And then people are like, Oh my god. <laughs> there's there's no hope now. Um Great love defies even death. I mean, well, I mean, great love would be patriotism. Oh, for yes. example. Yes, I like that one. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's an easy way of doing it, and then it's a deliberately bad negotiator, who, um, for his own reasons, and or it could be yes. I mean, let's go with that. Hmm. Yeah, I wanted to. That that's a good one because I, I keep thinking about Romeo and Juliet because that's the. The role model and yet i want to get away from that so patriotism is a good one that i lay my life down for country and so and and so it's the sacrifice that lives on right this is the, the mm. but if people have no memory then it's all in vain because it, it only works if it's remembered um no 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 patriotism doesn't require memory it just requires you to lay down your life for your country my country right or wrong but then defies. So, how does it defy? Oh, it defies even death. 
I'm going to look at the definition of define it because I want to see if, if, uh, if there's something in there. Defy. Uh, defy definition. What does it mean? What does it really mean? Hmm. To, re to defy means to, re to renounce one's allegiance. Oh. Uh, to challenge, to fight, dare to meet in combat. Uh, to challenge, defy, provoke, renounce a belief, repudiate a vow, renounce one's faith, um, dare someone to do something. So, defies, great love, renounces death, challenges death. Okay, let's see. Repud repudiates, I don't believe in death. Hmm. So challenge, renounce, um, repudiate. I have a thesaurus here. Let me just see if it. So, oops. so we great love. It's so funny. I nearly, I nearly got rid of this. I always regret getting rid of books. Yes. Nearly. You never know when you'll need them as toilet paper in the next pandemic. Yes. There you go. You're right. That must be under defy D E F Y. So, so this is basically saying that death cannot kill love. Love will live on. Disregard. Sorry, disregard, I'm ignore, flout, fly in the face of, disobey, disobey, slight, set at naught, scoff at, thumb one's nose at, snap one's fingers at, disdain. Spurn, deride, condemn, despise, challenge, dare, double dare, double dog dare, confront, front, face, meet face to face, meet head on, meet eyeball to eyeball, square off. Or withstand, stand, endure, hold up, hold out, bear up. So I think with, with when you said dare and, and, and mm. uh, scoff, I... I think that uh, this sort of explains the character personality of this negotiator, that the reason why they're willing to throw the dice is because they just have this attitude of, you know, um, but if the attitude really could a, also have been brought about by if a, you know, a partner had died or something. And so there's a, there's an element of revenge an element of recklessness in it. Mm -hmm. So they're really a reckless, erratic uh, they're sort of a reckless yeah. so, uh, so negotiator I, I actually like this now because the so negotiator becomes a social pariah they're sort of flip side of the same person um, it's like oh please don't send in the negotiator it's like you know you have a crisis it's like no no don't send in the negotiator because all they're going to do is escalate the situation and then we're going to because they say great love defies even death I laugh in the face of death and of course mm. then all kinds of problems ensue um, this is, this is like, um, Trump going to the meeting with, with the North Korean leader and bringing, you know, a suitcase bomb and saying, you know, I'm going to press this button unless you do what I tell you to. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm trying to think of, it's a cavalier, um, cavalier in the face Right, you know what time it is. Of death. Oh, it's it's kitty time. Mm. It's cat nip time. All right. <laughs> well, I think we've got it. We've got this. Uh, I, I like this. We've got this a is couple the, of ones there. The, the negotiator that nobody wants because yep. of their attitude, and they they um, they always they escalate and create more problems than they than they began with. <laughs> yeah. All right, what's the what's the meal tonight? What is it? Is it fish or is it cheese or what? What does the cat get tonight? It's fish tonight. Tonight's fish night. Okay, so this is be tomorrow. For, you know, Catholics, but luckily they're not Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> so, Always good to see you. Thank you very much for for joining. It's fantastic today. to see you. No, my my absolute pleasure.